So welcome to today's MTD Daily News. You join us here from our studios in the heart of Northamptonshire. Uh, we've got a great guest on today's show, uh, Paul Butler from Rotec Engineering. Now Paul's going to talk to us about uh, his story, his journey in manufacturing um, into what has become or the owner of a really successful engineering business. Uh, so Paul, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Thank you. Pretty good. Yeah, good, good. Paul, let's start Thanks by uh, let, let's start by talking about um, uh, Paul Butler. Let's talk about you. You know where you started in engineering and uh, yeah, your history. Okay, so I guess um, I can consider myself to be pretty privileged to be one of the last um, apprentices trained at Allen Gears in Persia, a great Rolls Royce company. Um, I, I um, and then I did that until I was twenty one and a half, as we did in those days. And then I set up a, a company in Birmingham with a partner. Um, that was a bit of a baptism of fire for me. First time I ever got involved in running a business. I was the, I was the ops director, but actually what that meant was I made all the stuff on the shop floor and he did all the selling and the kind of business side of things. Uh, unfortunately, we were involved in special purpose machinery, uh, design and manufacturing special purpose machinery for the metalworking industry, some of it quite complex. And uh, that was pretty much came to an abrupt end in 1989 with the first recession. Um, all special, special projects were kind of axed overnight pretty much so that, that, that sort of business finished quite quickly. Now, so I, that, well, I would imagine you learnt a lot from that, Paul, and I mean, that could be instrumental in the reason for the success of your company today, Rotec Engineering Limited. Um, for our viewers that haven't seen any of the videos that we've done at your place, tell us uh, briefly in, about the company that you own now. Well, Rotec was born out of the uh, fact that when I finished uh, my, my, the first company, um, I, again, I was very acute of the, the, the problem was that we had these huge projects and we, we spent months building this huge machine, this piece of machinery, very complex, and we installed the machine, and then it was all, it was all finished, and we had to find a new one to build, which was, which was quite a challenge. So I decided I wanted, it was very difficult to scale, I wanted a business which was scalable, hence um, I decided to get into single spindle um, type turning, thinking I could get find a customer where he could give me an order for a thousand parts a month and I could get another customer for another thousand parts a month and build it like that, which is what I did. My first machine was, a, I bought a machine, uh, which was an old Ward Capstan 1A, which was actually had been rebuilt, had a, had a plaque on it, so it had been rebuilt in London in 1961, so that tells you how old this thing must have been. Um, I paid 200 pounds back from a guy in Cheltenham, um, and it started out of an old converted pig sty, uh, we can fall not too far from here. On a disused pig farm, um, I ended up boring the building myself, getting the machine up and running, and you know, uh, and started making these small pins called stripper pins that we still make now, actually, for the for the die making industry. Um, did that for about twelve months, then I realised that I ended up in hospital with um, carpal tunnel syndrome and repetitive strain injury. I'd rigged this capstan with um, air as air feed unit, and, uh, uh, so we basically. Could I could actually produce 500 parts an hour, which is the, still a limit, still a, still a, actually a, um, a record these days, even with the modern kit we use these days to make these pins. But, <laughs> I mean, and this was back in what, 1990, mid 90s, wasn't it? 90, this was about, I, I ran as a sole trader for a year. It was about, 90, it was about 94, 95. Um, so yeah, 93, 94, I guess. I ran as a sole trader for a couple of years um, before we got things, got on the feet again. Um, so, yeah, we, and then I basically bought my first cam auto, which was that was a, that was an interesting, which is like a you know capstan machine run by cams. But um, well, I well, well, let's look at what's changed now then, because I mean, you come around your machine shop, you've got Nakamura multitasking machines, um, you're a wash with star sliding head lathes, everything. When people talk about automation, you really you know you have gone down this path, haven't you? Um, even with your whole to robots loading machines, uh, what are the changes that you've seen within industry uh, within the last two decades? Let's say. Well, for me, it was all about through the pain that I went through with the capstans and cam autos, and, uh, and then I bought my first um, star machine, and it was literally it changed everything overnight for me. I mean, the day the machine went in, we ran the machine that night, and we made two and a half thousand parts overnight of these pins that we were making. And I, I realised at that moment, it was just a, it was just a, that single moment was, was to define everything for the future, for my, to define my future, because Within um, about six months from that, we got rid of all the cams, all the because they were a nightmare, really. Considering how, it, by, well, by modern standards I mean, modern machinery, how how reliable they are, these stars, you set the job of it, just run and run around with no problems, and relatively easy, you know, relatively easy to program by comparison. 
Now, and a lot has changed um, in, in, in your business and in indus industry in general. And one of the things we hear a lot about is adaptability. You need to respond quickly to customer demands, don't you? Different types of applications that need to be, that need to be created, designed and machined, uh, sometimes within hours, certainly within some of the industries that you serve. Absolutely. I mean, this is uh, this has become our mantra now. But just kind of having, if, if we talk a little bit, how we got there, because from the start, it really taught us that we, we ran, you know, we ran, we started buying stars, we started, uh, and we um, automation became everything for us. We realised we could have reduced staff, running unmanned, you know, uh, running seven or eight machines to one go, which is fantastic. And then as we started to increase our capacity over the thirty you know, the standard kind of thirty-two mil. mil we really start to run push the boundaries of what these modern, what these modern machines can do. Because even now, a lot of fixed head machines don't really like to run an automatic. They're not really configured, but not, a lot of them aren't really configured that way, um, unless you buy the right ones. And that's when we started talking to um, going back. We bought our Ford first NTY3 off uh, ETG, which was a fantastic piece of equipment. I don't think even turning technology at the time even knew what it could do. But I recognised it as a machine that Japanese had designed to actually compete with sliding head machines. And uh, we, we picked it up and straight away and had the first machine fitted with a three metre bar feed. And again, it was another, that was another stretching our capability of true automation to a, to, to a 42 mil capacity um, on a single spinning machine. And now, as you know, these days now we've gone right to the, um, we're stretching ourselves to where we've, well, the NTRXs which are fantastic, fantastic machines. We've got three of these now fitted with Holter robot systems. But we've, of, we've kind of changed our um, tact a little bit in terms of where before you try and match the job to exactly the right size machine to make the to, you know, chasing seconds on cycle times. We've moved away from that a little bit in terms of, um, because we realised when we start, as we grow, we start measuring our business, measuring what we do and how efficient we are as a lot of people do have to these days. Um, and we really realise that it's not about seconds on cycle times and parts, it's really about the bit what you do between the setups, that's what's costing us the money. So we started to try and focus on that. So we've come, we've, we've kind of come up with this, um, we believe we've come up with this kind of um, very, very diverse machining solution where we can have one machine that's very complex, you know, five axis, well, twin spindle lathe with a complete, uh, you know, milling type system on it with 80 tools behind it. Five axis, robotic loading, bar feed loading, so we can do bar feed, robotic unload, vice versa. Um, very adaptable, very, very diverse, allowing us to basically to use the same piece of equipment to produce a diverse range of parts. The idea being that we have a quite a systematic approach to we get a part, we quote it, generate a certain off the cam system, or you know, compare it to as other people compare it to something we've done previously. And um, produce a part on the same. So now we've got a bank of machines that are all configured the same kind of way in, in a machining cell, which is. Um, um, and very... what about what, what about one question on this? So the reliability of this process, um, you know, compared to compared to a human, do you ever have to worry about you know things not happening in quite the way that you wish they would? Parts coming off incorrectly, or do all of these automation factors um, improve those things? Well, because unlike. Um, I mean, as you know, automation has been around for a long time. You go to any car car factory where they're making, you know, car brake discs for cars. They've been doing it for, for donkey's years. But that's easy. Well, I say it's easy because you can go and buy a machining cell and set them to do one job bespoke, and it, it'll it'll work. What we're trying to do is use that that type of philosophy, but on a, on a very diverse so one job and the next. All, all the jobs are different. So. And, and, and have you? I mean, is there a message to other engineers that may be starting out uh, and thinking, well, it all sounds brilliant, but the, the level of investment? I mean, I, I was, uh, you know, amazed. Eight million pounds worth of investment in the business in recent years. Uh, I know you've moved to a, a purpose-built facility, your advanced manufacturing centre, but but smaller companies, um, entrepreneurs might be looking at this and thinking, it's going to it's going to cost me a fortune to get to this. But that journey, um, I suppose, success breeds success and it enables you to be able to take these steps, doesn't it? Well, you've got to be there to win it, like anything else. You know, if you're not going to spend the money, you're not going to, you know, you've, you've got two choices. You either invest and move forward or you just keep out, you know, you just keep, or you keep the same equipment you've already got and just keep lowering your alley weight to be competitive and that only leads one way. And I've always been acutely aware of that. So we've always, for us, it's always been pedal to the metal. And, but, you know, obviously, with these new machines, and it's, as you, the question you asked earlier on about the, the, the reliability of them, 
while the machine, each part of the machine is very reliable on its, you know, as a system to produce reliable, high quality parts, it's been a challenge because nobody does that. We're, we're kind of trailblazers in that respect. You know, we're fitting the robot to the machine, we're having to put probing systems on the machine and get all the software to integrate. So we're actually getting these outputs that we need so we can, so we can prove we can. Um, uh, run reliable parts, and, and and it is a fascinating uh, business you've got, Paul. It, you know, you've you've done tremendously well, deserved every every bit of success that you've got, and I'm sure I can understand why clients come to you for their machining. Um, current situation within UK manufacturing and around the globe. Are you doing anything to be able to support uh, the the medical sector in this time of need? Uh, absolutely, yeah. We've put, um, we've put, you know, we've, we've kind of reached out ourselves, um, letting people know that we're, you know, we're, we're here, we're available, we, we, we have, um, we were, you know, able to divert capacity, critical capacity to the, to the kind of needs of the um, nation, if you like. Obviously, we're not um, because of, the, you know, we're a specialised machine company. The types of equipment these people need, that the, the NHS need, are going to be complete, you know, complete machines. So. We're very much part, of, you know. We could be very, very much part of that supply chain. So we've, we, you know, we're aware there's already uh, some contracts been placed with um, some large companies. So we talk to these people about supplying the componentry or some of the componentry that would go into these machines. Mm. And very much um, willing to press the button on that in terms of rapid turnarounds, um, you know, even design work and small project work in terms of small assemblies, etc. And you've seen no change in your business uh, today. You're still busy, still doing well, still inquiries coming in. Uh, machining that's that needs to be done. So it's been just really boring. It's actually it's it's a bit surreal, really, because I'm kind of you know we kind of at the weekends and, and in the evenings it's kind of going home and it's all a bit kind of strange. You know, it feels kind of like some kind of you know. But here it's all running as normal. Inquiries are coming in. We're quoting. We're winning orders. Okay. Everything seems quite buoyant. Very you know. I think we're all worried. Obviously, secretly worried about our families and, and you know, especially the older ones. You know, um, so uh, it'd be. You, you, You'd be, you know, strange not to be. But uh, but obviously, as a business, it's all very buoyant and and and, um, and at beat at the moment, really. Um, Good. So Good. We're, not, we're, we're we're kind of taking taking uh, precautions, making sure we don't waste money. Looking at you know, we're all battling down hatches a little bit, expecting things. You know, if people, if the economy does slow down, or they put the brakes on the economy to try and get a handle on this thing, then inevitably it's going to affect all of us. So we need to be ready for that, which is what we're trying to prepare ourselves for, really. Good stuff. We'll keep safe and good luck for the future, Paul, and thanks for joining us today. Brilliant. There you have it. What a company. Rotec Engineering in Evesham. Now, we have been to their advanced manufacturing centre. Definitely worth a visit. Some of the latest technology in action. And you can learn a lot from how Paul runs his business. And that's obviously why he's got to where he has got to today. Now, don't forget, we have a daily news show for you every day on MTD CNC. You can also see it on our uh, YouTube channel and throughout our social channels as we post uh, these great stories from great individuals that are joining us. And you can be one of them. If you want to come on to the show, drop us uh, an email at inquiries at mtdcnc.com uh, and we'd be glad to talk to you via Skype. That's it for today.